God, um, thanks for all that's going on in this world, the good and the not so good and the stuff that's heavy and the stuff that's light and beautiful. Um, help us bring all of it to you and help us to listen to you now, to hear from you and to hear from your word. Speak into our lives. We love you. Amen. Amen. Cool? Well, um, we are starting a brand new series. Oh, and we're getting a battery. Here, you can take that. I don't need it. Um, <laughs> okay, give me quick. All right. So anyways, that's a great time for me to solve and tell you about our new series. Um, we're starting a new series, and um, I was talking to John before he went on his little trip that he's on right now and said, kind of have some ideas about a series, want to talk it over, and he goes, well, you're going to do a lot of the preaching for a while while I finish up my book, so you can preach pretty much whatever you want. But uh, I told him that I wanted it to be a joint venture, and we started talking and having a conversation, and um, we kind of started talking about the purpose of the church. Why are, we, why are we here? What does the church do for people? What does the church do for the world? And I said, well, it, oh, yeah. Ah, nice. I said, well, I think it's to bring the good news of God to people so that they can be a part of what God's doing, because God has this amazing life for us, and um, and it's for those of us who have encountered God to also kind of delve deeper into what the kingdom of God could be. And um, he said, well, that sounds really vague. Um, <laughs> he said, what if it's to overcome fear? What if it's to overcome our fear of God, our fear of each other, and to invite us to step out into this life that God has for us that we're afraid of? So, well, that sounds pretty profound. So we got talking a little bit more, and I said, I want to I want to call the series Fear Less. Like, I know we can't get rid of fear altogether, but fearing less would be great. And he said, what if it was called Living Beyond Fear? And I thought, man, that's brilliant. All right? And so he goes, you know, Bruce Larson wrote a book about it, and I know Bruce Larson was his mentor. You should uh, check in my office. You can totally borrow it from me. So I go look in his office this morning. No joke. Came here to prepare the sermon a little bit more. Look in his office. Living Beyond Our Fears by Bruce Larson. So if you came here for something new, I'm sorry. Uh, between John and I, we're probably going to give you something that may have been said before, but the beautiful thing about God and about the scriptures, it's not that it's new, it's that it works in our lives and it is powerful. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at what it look, would look like to live uh, with less fear. I want to share my first memory of fear. Um, I was thinking back, and it was actually learning to ride a bike. That was my first memory of fear. And I remember it was taking the training wheels off, and my brother is running alongside my bike, kind of holding the back of it, making sure it's stable, and I'm pedaling and doing my thing that I've been taught to do on this thing. And all of a sudden, out of the middle of nowhere, I hear a voice about 100 feet behind me saying, you're doing it, you're doing it. And I think my brother envisioned that this would make little Chris all of a sudden go, wow, I am doing it. And he's like paddling, and I would make like a victory lap around the block or something. I don't know what he was envisioning. But in that moment that I heard his voice, I go, my brother's not with me anymore. <laughs> and fear took the handlebars. It took the wheel of, of this adventure. And all of a sudden, it turned into this. And the next thing it turned into was a face plant. Um, when fear takes the wheel, uh, things don't usually go well. Right now, um, my grandfather's estate is being settled. And it's amazing to watch kind of the, the fear pop up. The... Um, uncertainty about other family members and how they're going to try and manipulate this and um, the lack of trust and it creates division and divide and hurt uh, that doesn't need to be there. Fear rarely lets us be our best self. I know it has its purposes in our lives, it protects us in some ways, but fear um, often I think is too loud. It's obnoxious. Um, it insists on being hurt. It, I, I was listening to uh, a talk show about football players, and it was saying, quarterbacks are those people who walk in the room and the room tilts towards them. They say stuff and everybody kind of listens. I kind of feel that way about Coach Don. Kind of has a, <laughs> he tilts the room toward himself. Um, but fear tilts the room towards itself, too. Uh, it kind of begs attention from us, and we often give it to it. And we live in a world that is highly motivated by fear. It's everywhere you look. Um, 
I heard about a new company called Chariot. It just came out. It's a Uber, kind of Uber-esque company. It's, it's, a, it's a ride share kind of company. But it um, will cost you a little bit more, but it's called Chariot, and it is um, for women who are worried about being attacked by their Uber drivers. So <laughs> it's a legitimate fear. Mm -hmm. I mean, but it is all women drivers who have been highly screened instead of just your average Uber driver. Um, but I was looking at it and I'm going, somebody was really smart. They found the fear and they knew we can probably make a lot of money off of this. If you look around at politics and you watch the conversation, how much of it's motivated by fear? We're afraid of these people or those people. We're afraid of losing our prosperity. We're afraid of terrorism. We're afraid of going broke. We're afraid of polar ice caps melting and uh, ruining the world. We're afraid of being known by others. And that's because we're afraid of not being accepted by others. Um, we fear the unknown. We fear bad things happening to those we love. We fear that kids won't turn out right. We fear um, just about every area of our lives there is something to be afraid of. We, spiders. Spiders, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Disappointment, lacking, failing, succeeding, being lonely. Spiders, flying, public speaking. Yeah. Um, flying spiders. Flying spiders. <laughs> it's a powerful presence in our life. And it's crazy when fear kind of walks in the room. Uh, it's like a bully and all the things that we want out of our life seems to go away. Have you ever met somebody who is incredibly happy and really afraid at the same time? Or how about uh, really afraid but relaxed and at peace? <laughs> or really afraid and feeling really confident about things? Or really afraid and clear thinking and wise? No. John last week actually kind of started this series without anybody knowing it. And he spoke on 1 John 4, 18 where it says perfect love drives out fear. And love is the opposite of fear. It's, um, it's impossible to be loved perfectly and to be afraid of that one who is loving us. Um, in the same token, it's really, uh, I think, quite impossible to be loving towards somebody and to be afraid uh, of them at the same time. It's a choice. And fear usually motivates us um, to circle the wagons and to stay in small spaces. Um, there was a study done with kids in schoolyards and uh, whether or not they had a fence around the schoolyard. And um, when they don't have a fence, the kids would stay towards the teacher because the teacher provided that safety and that security that they knew they were okay. Um, but they didn't know how far they could go, where it would be safe or not. Um, and then they built fences around schoolyards. And kids go, oh, now I can venture out. Now I can explore and I know how far I can go. And so I can explore all this territory and I don't have to be close to the teacher. And I think we do that. When we are afraid, we stay in a really small space, and it feels safe and secure. And then we start worshiping things like safety and security. We circle the wagon, wagons rather than journey forward. And uh, fear will kill that adventurous spirit. Um, it's impossible to risk and grow to make new discoveries when you're afraid. It sucks the life out of us, and it's not very fun either. You lose your appetite, you don't enjoy what's going on around you when you're afraid. Um, apart from maybe going to a movie in that moment of being afraid in a scary movie, I can appreciate that. It just takes the spring from our step, um, and it has a high cost. So, what would it be like to live with less fear? Well, what could God do with our lives if fear didn't get to take the wheel or the handlebars? Um, what if instead of being afraid, we were filled with faith? As we went out into something, we go, God's got this. He's going to do something amazing. I can't wait to see what he does. What if we were um, hopeful instead of afraid? What if as we step into things, we say, we have no clue how this is going to turn out, but I bet it's going to be good. What if instead of being afraid, we were creative and loving and caring and we could go, oh yeah, of course I'm going to step towards this. We don't need to be afraid of it. Um, the best things come out of not being afraid. Fear never made great discoveries, never created a masterpiece, and never brought about reconciliation between enemies, never got a promotion, never helped someone in need. Fear stops us from living abundantly, as God intends. Simple as that. 
And Jesus knew this. Um, if you look at all the commands of Jesus in the Gospels, uh, and you kind of look at the ones that have to do with fear, 125 times Jesus says something along the lines of, don't be afraid, take heart, take courage, be of good cheer, at times when they're scared. 125 times, the closest thing that you'll find in terms of repetition next to that was said eight times. Jesus knew fear was a big deal. And in the Old Testament, people encounter God over and over. They encounter angels, they encounter God. Usually the first thing that's said out of their mouths, don't be afraid. That God says to people, he goes, don't be afraid. An angel of the Lord appears to someone and it said, don't be afraid. Mary, when she was encountered and told, you're going to bring forth Jesus, don't be afraid. I used to think that was just because God was really scary looking. <laughs> um, or maybe it was just that angels are really scary. And they're not like little babies with wings. But then again, if I saw a baby flying, <laughs> don't be afraid might be the thing I need to hear. <laughs> but the more and more I've kind of looked at these stories, the less and less I think it's about how God looks. I think it's the fact that God calls us into things that are outside our comfort zone. And he knows that we're never going to be able to walk into them if we can't figure out how to not be afraid. So the first thing that happens is says, I'm here to give you courage. You don't need to be afraid. So, we're going to look um, this first week at, at courage. Um, courage isn't the opposite of fear. Remember, the opposite of fear is love. love. Well done. Um, courage isn't the opposite of fear. Love it. Love drives out fear. Courage is the ability to move forward even though you're afraid. That's what courage is. Um, I've heard that People with courage have a tendency to stick around a little bit longer when they're afraid than everybody else. That's courage. Courage is facing fear, not the absence of it. And fear is a little bit like a storm. Uh, it sort of wells up around us. It's something that we don't want to have happen in our lives. And the tendency when fear gets a hold of us is for us to hunker down, right? Button the hatches, try and find safety, ride it out. Um, but there's another way through fear, and uh, so we're going to look at Matthew 14, 22 through 33, um, and it's a story, a story about courage and fear, um, and it shows us another route, it shows us a lot of courage, so, um, man, I'm tired of talking, will somebody else please read this passage for me, anybody out for that? Am I allowed to do this? I don't even know if I'm allowed, am I allowed to do this while you're alive? Sweet! Jonathan! Awesome! Do you, do you have it printed out? I do. <laughs> As do other people, and they're handing you. <laughs> right now, it's fantastic. <laughs> Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves, because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. The disciples saw him walking on the lake, and they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come out to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and he began to sink, and he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down, and those who were with them in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Awesome. Thanks, John. Two responses to fear in that text. <coughs> the disciples, legit, be terrified. You're sitting there, a storm has come up. Um, the Sea of Galilee is known for crazy storms that would come up out of nowhere. They're not making any headway. And then to make matters worse, they turn around and they see Jesus walking out on the water towards them. Um, and they figure, well, he must have been mobbed by the crowd after the feeding of the 5,000, and he died, and now we have a ghost coming to take his revenge on us for leaving him. Um, they were terrified. And I find it really, really cool that Peter found another way to look at this situation. He goes, well, 
either I should be terrified, or if it is you, Jesus, call me out on the water. It can prove it. Like, if you're there, Jesus, prove it. Um, he he kind of does this thing where he goes, okay, I can either be really afraid or I can have faith in Jesus. And so I'm going to ask God to do what I want. And I'm going to see what he tells me to do. And so Jesus says to him, do it. Come on out, Peter. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, where we walk by faith and not by sight. Uh, we have options as we look around. We see a lot of circumstances, and we see lots of reasons to be afraid. Um, and we're invited by Paul and by Peter and, and by Jesus to take heart, trust, to say, what can God do with this? And then to step out into that. It's another option that doesn't normally occur to us. So Peter saw Jesus, and, and Jesus is his focus, and so he says, let the adventure begin. Let's step out. I can sit here in this boat and be terrified, or I can see what God can do. And he comes up with the stupid idea of walking on water, and Jesus says, that sounds fun. Let's do that. Um, as we navigate our fears, we do not do so alone. We have God with us. The beauty of the Holy Spirit is God not just around us, visiting us, God in us, walking with us and saying, I'm going to be with you through this. And God can do things that we normally can't believe are possible. But we get a choice. We always have a choice. Safety, fear, huddle in the boat, be terrified, not make progress. Or step out, see what God can do. And it's not unfounded. This isn't blind optimism. This is not how I used to be when I go, well, I guess I'll just try this and hope it works out. Um, my little nephew is absolutely fearless. He, he, he loves skateboards. And um, I remember like at eight years old, he was like, there's a staircase. I wonder if I can jump off of that. And he would do it. He'd go like 12, 15 stairs and just, just go for it. But he was absolutely fearless. And I thought, that is not healthy. <laughs> <laughs> but I honestly think that he just kind of had a blind optimism about what he was capable of until he found out otherwise. Um, I was more the fatalist. Like, I step out into things sometimes and I go, this will probably not work. It's going to go bad, but here I go. Um, John can be a little bit of fatalist. <laughs> but I think there's a, a different spot where it's faith and trust, where we say, God's bigger than this thing that I'm stepping into. He's got me, so I can trust him with it. Scripture says if God is for us, who can be against us? God works all things together for the good of those who love him. That means as we step out, as we risk, as we adventure, as we um, step into the unknown, we know that God's going to work this thing to our good so we can trust that he's bigger than what's going on around us. There's a story of um, a pastor who's, who's going out on a hike, and uh, his little son was scrambling along the rocks next to him, and, and suddenly the son decided uh, to leap into his dad's arms. Why not? He just choked. And the, dropped his stuff, he turned and caught his son, panicking and going, do you realize how badly that could have gone? <laughs> said, no, you're my dad. Of course you have me. And, and it's that sort of childlike trust that we can step into the things that make us afraid and go, God's got me. Yeah, it might not go well, but God's got me. And he's bigger than what it is I'm jumping into. But fear isn't always a choice and it's not always a decision. Um, sometimes stuff comes up around us and we're just afraid. A storm comes up. It says that, that Peter, as he was walking on this water, saw the wind and the waves. Now, I have no clue what happened with those windows of the waves that made him afraid then rather than before when he was getting out of the boat. But uh, at some, he, he, he sees the winds and the waves and he's afraid. You know, he saw the storm and he realized this was a bad idea. I think we see uh, blank when we start to go, man, I am in a not good place. This was a bad idea. And when that happens, um, sinking begins. The funny thing is that uh, I think what changed was Peter's focus. 
What was he focused on? One second he's focused on Jesus, and Jesus is saying, hey, let's do this. The next second he's focused on, yeah, but here's all the reasons why that can never win. Wait, I'm walking on fire. That was impossible before we got out of the boat. Um, what changed was this focus, and that feels profoundly practical to me. Where is it we're heading? And if we're focused on that, rather than on all the reasons that something can't happen and on all the things that we have to be afraid of, when we're afraid, we cannot move forward. And it's even more true when the driving force of our life is God. We say, God is there inviting me to step out. Can I stay focused on him? Because the second we start to look at every reason that we can't do something, we're not going to move forward every reason to be afraid. The opposite of courage isn't um, fear, just as fear, or just as courage isn't the opposite of of fear. Um, It's discourage. The wind discouraged Peter. The waves discouraged Peter. The negative possibilities in general will discourage us. The reasons why something can't happen will discourage us. But there's another side of that word, encourage. And and to add courage, um, God, the community of faith, the Holy Spirit, they all repeatedly throughout Scripture encourage. They add courage to your life. I have a friend who's a missionary in Haiti, and I remember when he was getting ready to go, uh, he was like, man, this is going to cost a lot of money, and I don't have enough money, and I don't want to have to ask people. But eventually he had to, and so he went to all these different churches, and he talked to people, and some people go, man, that's really cool. You want to start an orphanage in Haiti and and help folks uh, learn arts and stuff, and so they began supporting him. And I talked to him uh, before he left, and I remember him saying, so glad I had to ask everybody. I'm so glad I didn't have all that money to be able to do this thing. Because now, I have a whole community of people who are going on this trip with me. It encouraged him. Um, We are in a fantastic church. I came out of a church situation before this, um, where I didn't get along with the lead pastor, and it it just ended badly, and I went and was doing um, office work for a year and a half, because I sort of knew how to do office work, even though I do it badly, Um, (laughs) but people liked me, so they sort of kept me around, Um, but I tried to go backwards in my life, to go back to being an admin assistant, I didn't want to be a pastor, because church is hard, and uh, why this place? Why was it okay? That's the question John actually asked me last week. Why is it okay for you to come here then and start being a pastor again? Because this is such a great group of people. I mean, John's great to work for. You all are great to be with because we just do life together. But it comes down to this. Encourage. Whether I fall on my face here, I was reminded of this by Janet this week, whether I fall on my face and you hate the sermon, or whether it goes great, whatever adventures we go on together in this church, whether they end well or whether they uh, don't, we can risk it, we can do it together because we encourage one another. That's how it works. The word for the Holy Spirit used repeatedly in scriptures is the paraclete. It means the one who comes alongside. You have one who comes alongside you in the Lord. You have a church that comes alongside you as you face whatever it is you fear in life. And so we can be encouraged. There's one more thing that's uh, really important in this text. Peter failed the test. Jesus said, come out to me. Go for it. I will give you the strength and the power to do this thing. You don't need to be afraid. So step out of the boat and walk towards me. And Peter started to, and then he saw the wind and he saw the waves and it freaked him out, and so he started sinking. And then it says that Jesus was really let down, and he let Peter keep sinking, and he hopped into the boat, and then he sailed away with Peter still floundering there. And um, he said, you have little faith, why did you doubt? And he left him to drown. Right? Isn't that what it said? No. When you read that thing that Jesus says, you have little doubt, I don't think of it as... He was putting him down. I don't think he was saying, man, you failed the test. 
And think of it more like a reminder. I've got you. You will doubt. Or you will faith. You will doubt it. You don't need to. I've got you. And then he pulled him up. God's got us. When you feel the water rising about that thing that you're afraid of and it's coming up by your neck, Jesus' hand is going, I've got you. He lets us walk. He lets us try. He lets us step out of the boat. And when we sink and when we fail, I've got you. I am with you, even to the end of the age. You're in good hands, with all say. Um, yeah, it's a great ad campaign because they're saying, we're going to give you financial security so that you can risk it. When something bad, unexpected happens to you, you're not going to go bankrupt. But that's just money. The reality is with God, you're in good hands. What can separate you from the love of God that drives out fear? Romans 8, 39, Paul says this, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, the present nor the future, nor any powers, not height or death, not anything in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. And it's in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing is bigger than God. <coughs> and so we end up where we begin, First John 4. Perfect love drives out fear. We don't need to be afraid. We're in God's hands. We're in good hands. So even if we are afraid, we can take courage. This week, as you face whatever it is that brings up fear, fix your eyes on Christ. Listen. Don't be afraid to risk. And may you find that God and his love and his grace and his power and his strength and his presence close to you is with you as you step through it. Sound like fun? All right. Let's pray. God, thank you for taking us from people who are afraid to being people who don't need to fear. Help us to take courage, to be encouraged by one another and by you. Lord, help us to be honest with you and with each other about the things we're afraid of so that we can have company along the journey that might encourage us. Lord, strengthen us by your Holy Spirit as we step into this week. May we be people who risk 